Welcome to Triangle B and I. Today's show is brought to you by Simply Done Concierge. Uh, we talk all the time, folks. How can we be in two places at once? Well, with the certified team at Simply Done Concierge, you can go do what you need to do, and they'll come in, help you at your house, do some shopping, do some pet sitting, do some meal prep, things like that. So you can be two places at once and get more things done during the day. If you go to simplydoneconcierge.com, uh, send them a note of what you what you need. I know they'll be able to help. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Manning. Each week on Triangle B&I, we bring you a local small business success story. If you are not familiar with B&I, it is Business Networking International, the world's largest networking organization. Our little slice of heaven here in the Triangle, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, and the surrounding towns. We have 33 chapters, soon to be 34 chapters that meet each week, about 570-ish members. And our goal is to help each other grow their business. Our local small business success story this week is Lee Smith with the Tarva Group. Lee is in RD25, the Smithfield Strategy. They meet Tuesday mornings at 8.15 at the Building Industry Association facility in Smithfield. And Lee, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, Mike. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on with you. Glad to have you. You do one of the coolest things that I've seen in B&I in a while. It's A, I can't, I'm not gifted enough to do it, but I'm fascinated by people that, that do it. So the Tarva Group does a number of things. The uh, aerial services, digital media, and professional development. But Lee, that is ho- correct, yes. yep. Lee holds the drone aerial services seat in BNI because BNI is seat specific. And so I'm just, every time I see you, I think of three new questions to ask because I'm just fascinated by this world. You do a great job of explaining to people if you need a 3d look at something because in life if we're walking on the ground everything is 2d but in your world you can give us a view of things we'd never thought of seeing from that angle that's correct yeah our big two big things with aerial photography one is perspective obviously it it really changes the way you see what you're seeing um, you're seeing uh, patterns that you normally don't see from the ground. You're able to show a broader perspective. And so because of that, uh, we love to be able to tell people's story using that that change in perspective and and market folks in that way. And I'm, I'm intrigued by that because normally when we think of drones, we think over a building, over a golf course, if there's a golf tournament, now that we see those more and more, or just you know, people kind of, you know, playing with them around their house. But the more I talk to you and the more I read up on this, I'm starting to think about farms and big construction sites where you can't, even if you just wanted to count all the vehicles you had, you now can do that for that owner, can't you? Absolutely. Um, The technology has advanced so much. I've been flying drones for uh, right, right at 13 years now. And when I first started flying drones, drones were just something fun that you did. Um, it just was something like, you know, they were basically made out of foam with a little electric motor in them and you crashed them and you broke them and you went and bought another one. Um, you know, even though that another one may have been a few hundred dollars at the time, you know, now we're looking at drones that are in the tens of thousands of dollars, some of them. And the technology is just to advance so much in, in the industry and in, in these last, uh, you know, decade plus and you can do so much more with them. You can object track with them. You can subject track with them. Uh, you can do three-dimensional modeling with them. I mean, literally, uh, no no pun intended, but the sky really is the limit <laughs> when it comes to what you can do with them. Yeah. Um, it had just dawned on me as I was reading up reading up on some things over the weekend, just the 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 things you can use it for now that, and again, we've never had a, a even a 500-foot look at what we own. I know I chuckle and I think I'm correct on this. I don't think I'm outing anybody, but I've heard tell that there are roofers who are afraid of heights. So they send their drone up above the house to look at the roof. And I'm thinking like, that's going to tell me about 60% of what I know, right? That, that's correct. <laughs> that is correct. Yes, sir. I mean, you kind of got to put your hands on some industries. 
Yep. That that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, we can put a drone up and we can get real, real close. But sometimes you actually have to put the hands actually on the on the roof in order to be able to see some things. What what got your first drone in your hand? For me, honestly, it was just something fun to do. Like I said, um, you know, going on 13 years, uh, I've always loved aviation, uh, always loved being around uh, being around the industry. And so for me, it started out as something fun. Uh, and then as I began to be part of the aviation industry more and more, um, you know, I was actually, I'm, I'm still am involved in the Civil Air Patrol. And I was having a conversation with one of our squadron leaders one day, and he said, you know, um, you, you do this anyway, right, with, with different other areas in your business. Why don't you make this a diff separate division in aerial servicing? And, and the more I looked into it, the more I realized exactly how much could be done with the drone. And uh, obviously the technology had gone from just something fun that you do to show someone a neat picture, which back then a neat picture was a lot lower quality, <laughs> lower resolution than what we can provide now with a 4K image. But, you know, it was something fun then. So now, you know, as we look at it in the industry, we're talking $16 billion plus industry every year. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a huge, huge slice of the business pie. And so, you know, when you look at that and you look at what you can do in that, that's the more I read, the more I got into it, the more I realized, hey, this is something I really love to do. And it's like I told my wife um, one day, you know, literally I had a full day from one drone shoot to the next and I got to the end of the day. And I mean, I was tired, you know, you're out in the sun, it's hot. I said, you know, this is, but this is what I love to do. And, and I said, if I could have a day like today where I can not only help people get their message out, but spend a lot of time seeing things from a perspective that not anyone can see, man, it's a great day. And so, you know, that's just what continues to drive me and give me passion is in, in our industry, you know, being able to show people that perspective, that uniqueness. And so, yeah, that's what's kept me in it. And, uh, and I love, I love what I do. What I, I guess one of the first ways that people started monetizing it was for aerial shots for real estate. Because you, we've got Correct. the, you know, you go in a house with a still camera and you shoot those shots. We get that, the kitchen, the master bedroom, master bath, all that. But then people wanted aerial shots. What, what were some of the other initial monetizations for you and drones and that industry? Right. So another big thing is tower surveys. Um, looking at large scale communications towers. The reason for that is it's awfully hard to fly a normal fixed winged aircraft close enough or even a rotor aircraft like a helicopter close enough with guide wires and things like that. Well, you can take a drone and you can put a drone right next to a communications tower, staying away from those guide wires, keeping everybody on the ground safe. Um, and it just, and so the other thing was tower surveys was the big, uh, big kind of push into that besides real estate and things like that, that were up in the air, uh, not only communications towers, but, you know, any kind of large structure where you did not want to put a standardized aircraft next to it. When you were surveying these towers, would you just, just when you got your drone going, did you just raise it up next to the tower the whole way? Do you go out? How do you get to where the point on the so tower it, you it need? Right. We always have a flight plan, and it depends on kind of what the what the client wants. Some clients have a specific area that they want to focus in on. They they feel like they've got a, a issue on a certain section, and so we can just fly right in and look at that section. Or sometimes they'll literally want the entire you know, scope of it. So we would actually fly and we do a, a loop around to make sure everything looks solid from what we can see from as we kind of concentrically close in on that structure. Then what we would do is focus on those different parts and then we could actually go right up next to the tower and do a full length tower. You know, and the great thing is, you know, in the aviation community, we in the as drone pilots have the ability to work within that airspace with some restrictions, obviously, but within that airspace to do what we need to do as far as going all the way up to the top of that tower, going above it, and then coming back down. When you are doing an inspection on a tower like that, is, it a, is this a one-person job? How many people do you have with you? Well, normally when we fly a job like that, we have at least two people. We have a pilot in command. Uh, who's actually flying the the drone itself and then we also have a spotter and the spotter is there to make sure that you know the pilot's going to be focused on actually what's going on with the drone um, and then the the spotter is the one who's making sure that we stay away from other things that we don't need to be running into uh, looking out for other objects looking out for for wildlife you'd be surprised how many large birds uh, don't like drones and so <laughs> you know we have to we have to work with that sometimes um, a, a great video I saw not too long ago was actually when a large hawk 
literally pulled a drone right out of the sky. So uh, it, it really does matter to have that spotter there. So at least a two person team in a situation like that. Um, and then if we can have a third, we'd have a third on the ground, making sure that the ground crew is taken care of, making sure that people aren't, you know, coming up and disturbing what's going on with the pilot in command or the spotter. So, yeah, there, there's different roles that we have depending on what the client needs are. So I imagine your maverick and your spotter is goose, right? <laughs> that's, that's a good way to look okay. at it. Okay. Yep, right. Just make it sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Cause I figure if you're flying, the last thing you're doing is looking at, at anything else. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And you record all this for the client. That is correct. We, we shoot it in high resolution video so that they can go back and replay it and take a look at it and see. And because it is such high resolution imagery, they can actually zoom in on that video and make it make a really good determination on what they need to see. If they have a, let's say a 200 foot tower. So before drones got here, if they felt like there was something wrong at the 80 foot mark on their tower, how did they get up there and how did they get up there and see that prior to you? They would do a couple of different things. The first thing is they would try to, if, if they could, they could fly around it. They could get a, an aerial photographer um, <laughs> and put them in a plane, put them in a fixed wing aircraft, take a really large telephoto lens and try to zoom in. And I can tell you as someone who works with aerial photography with the civil air patrol, trying to get that kind of shot and steady that camera is a tough thing to do. Um, so then the other option was to actually put a human being on the tower and climb it. Um, and, you know, these are the guys that get paid twenty or $30,000 to to do that. And God bless them, because I can tell you, I love to fly. I love to be in an aircraft. I love to fly drones. You will never see me on the side of a 2000 foot tower. Um, I just, it's not going to happen. Um, so, so, but that's what they do. They have a tower climber and they go inspect it. But obviously you can think, you know, when you're spending those kind of dollars, when you're talking thousands of dollars, you know, to put somebody on the tower versus quite a bit less than that to actually have us come out and fly, it, it's a big difference. So, yeah, the industry has changed a lot because of drones. Well, and then you've got to record it on video because if the guy's climbing up there, he might get a couple of pictures, but probably not checked out as a really That's good right. photographer. You, you put a tower climber up, you tell him, hey, take the video, take the picture. Um, what did you see? And then in the earliest days, they were relying on the description and they would have, from what I understand, I've talked to some of these guys, they would actually draw out what they saw because this was before really digital photography existed. And so, you know, they'd come back and the camera, the, the light wouldn't be right or whatever. And so, yeah, I mean, it really has made a huge difference for, wow. for what people do when it comes oh, to I, tower survey. I love that. Before we get back to this, uh, how did you come up with the name, the Tarva Group? That, that's a great question. I love answering this. So if you're a, liter, a literary fan, uh, you've got the Chronicles of Narnia. Yep. In the Chronicles of Narnia, there is a book, uh, or the, one of the series uh, called Prince Caspian. Uh, in the book, if you go and you grab the movie and say, I'm, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do my research, I'm going to watch the movie. It's not in the movie, so you got to read the book. But in the book Prince Caspian, there is uh, two celestial bodies. Uh, Tarva and Ambril. And when those two celestial bodies come into conjunction, it signifies success in the future. So uh, that is why we say uh, the Tarva Group strategy for success, because we see it as an alignment with your business, a partnership, not a vendorship, but a partnership with your business for your success in the future. And the other name with Tarva was what? Uh, Ambril was the other celestial. That would have been a hard one to explain to people in a meeting. See, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Am yep. Ambril. Yeah. Yep. No. <laughs> how, do you, how do you spell that? I wrote down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good. We have, Believe it or not, we have enough tough, tough enough time with Tarva. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but a good name. I like that. I'm always intrigued by how people come up with their company name and, and that's good stuff. All right. So let's bring in the FAA to your world. Yes. They wanted a piece of the pie here and they wanted to make sure things were right. So we know that you can't fly near an airport. Correct. So we kind of knew that from the beginning, but now correct. there's even more restrictions that they want on you guys to do this right. Correct. Correct. So there are several different things. Um, it de depends on the airspace, right? The area around uh, an airport is a different class of airspace than what you normally have every day um, in what's called class G airspace, which uh, without giving, you know, everyone a little list in an airspace, I can just say that most airspace except for around an airport is class G airspace. Um, when you're talking about larger airports, class A, uh, 
smaller airports, you know, but the little smaller class B, class C, and so on. And you can you can still, if you need to, you can request authorization and get it uh, if you have a legitimate reason to be flying um, in an you know more restrictive airspace. Uh, but yes, the FAA qualifies the airspace. The FAA lets us know where we can and can't fly in that sense. And we can request a waiver. We can request authorization if we need to. But yes, they very much want to be involved in that. And there's a reason for that. The reason is safety. It comes down to ultimately safety. Um, you know, we are restricted as, as pilots in the, drone, in the drone world to fly no greater than 400 feet above ground level or what's called AGL. And the reason for that is because they want a nice buffer between the where we fly area and where a small single engine aircraft would fly. And so most aircraft, unless they have a really good reason, they're not gonna drop below a thousand feet on a regular basis, uh, like a, a single engine Cessna or a Piper or some, something like that. So that gives a little bit of buffer there. Um, of course, if we have a reason to go above that, we can. If they have a reason to go below that, they can, but that way there gives a buffer there and they help control that, that airspace. And so there's a couple different ways. One is they obviously have the regulations that are in place. No ways they have the, the waivers and stuff that you have to do. And then the other thing is they have now, they've introduced and it's gonna be coming in September, uh, remote ID requirements as well for drones. So uh, large drones, drones that weigh 400 grams or greater are gonna actually have to have remote ID capability, meaning that they're gonna produce uh, a remote signal that will actually wow. give their identification away. So if say you fly into an area where you're not supposed to be, they're gonna be able to pull that remote ID and they're going to be able to ultimately track it back to the manufacturer who intends going to track it back to you. So they're going to they're going to figure out who you are. So I always tell people it's best to follow the rules. Everybody wins that way. Yeah. And you and I have had a couple of conversations on this and I know you run across that. We'll just call them arrogant. John arrogant. John's <laughs> like, yeah, man, I can fly those things. I don't need the FAA. I'm never around anybody or anything. And they, tend to, the, the authorities tend to start, they're starting to find people like him real quick, aren't they? That's exactly right. So, so one of the things uh, that you have to understand with remote ID is it exactly, it's going to be transmitted all the way down to your first responders. So they're, they're going to be able to track you down. Um, it, it's one of those things where you really need to make sure that you're doing the right things for the right reasons um, and being, being safe about it. You know, I always have had these conversations like with the arrogant Johns, that's a great way to say it, where people say, well, you know, I'm going to fly my drone where I want to. It, no, it doesn't work that way. It um, did, gonna, right? You need to fly your drone yeah. where you need to. Yeah. You know, but yeah, a couple of years ago, it did. He could pretty right. much, he could fly in more places than he can today just because he wanted Ab to. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, th th there is. And, and the good thing is the FAA has created systems in place to help work within that community, you know, as much as they can. Yeah. Um, you know, they, it's one of those things where, like I say, you can, you can request a waiver. If you're going to be flying in a certain area. You can request a flight authorization. So there's different ways that you can go about it legally and the right way. Um, their biggest thing is they don't want people on the ground hurt. Um, and they definitely don't want people doing things illegal with their drones. Um, you know, there's been a lot of times I've had conversations with people say, well, you know, should I worry about my neighbor flying my drone in over my property and swooping down and seeing my wife who's, you know, sunbathing on the back deck? Well, if you see a drone over your house, then yeah, you need to call the authorities, um, you know, and find out what's going on with that. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I've, I've actually been in neighborhoods before flying for clients for different reasons and, and had people come up to me and say, hey, listen, what are you doing? And they're super polite when they do it, but I have my, I have the authorizations. I know why I'm there. I explain that to local responders and they say, you know what, have a great flight, you know? And, yeah. and one thing I always tell people is, and this goes back to your arrogant, John, sometimes you have your arrogant ground team members too. They say, well, I'll just shoot the drone out of the air. Yep. Don't do that. It's yep. a federal crime to shoot a drone out of the air. And so that's let's save yeah. everybody the trouble there. Just don't do that. So um, that, nobody, yeah. nobody wins there. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to go there next, but I want to go back to the point you made that when, uh, neighbors come out and they walk up to you, you're every, all the T's are crossed. All the I's are dotted. It's much like business insurance and homeowners and, and renters. We're all guilty of this. People say, oh yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm here to, we have an $89 special. We'll come in and look at all your, you know, AC units and we'll look at your house and oh, 89 bucks. Great. Come on in. And they never ask for insurance. And some of these companies don't have insurance. So 
that's a that's the first red flag for anybody if they're watching somebody like you in a neighborhood one day and they walk up and and you or your one of your competitors says lady get away from me i know what i'm doing that's a big red flag red flag isn't it absolutely and the great thing is that even the insurance community has come under uh, you know more advisement as far as how they can help us in the drone community um you know they have things before they you just had business insurance but now you can actually have individualized what's called whole insurance where each actual drone we insure differently based on the usage of the drone. And so if something were to happen while we're out in the field, we have that whole insurance that not only covers the drone, which is great for us, but it also covers anything that the drone may come in contact with. And so that's helpful for those that we're, you know, flying for and flying around. All right. Amnon had a great question. If you, because you're a certified pilot, if you see a drone hovering around your house one day, can you get your drone out? and go chat with his his or her drone and scare them away you know that that's a great question i've often thought if if i ever see one what would i do um I, I think honestly yeah i would i would probably put mine in the air and i would find out i would trace it back and find out where where the the pilot is sitting <laughs> or standing and i i'd go have a chat with him yeah absolutely so you because one of the things i did learn doing my uh research is the drone pilot has got to be line of sight. That so, is correct. Right. So that you can't correct. stand in front of your house and fly your drone a quarter mile away down the other street in your neighborhood just because you want to mess with one of your neighbors. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. If if you do, you of course you can do anything, but I would yeah. not advise that. Correct. Because yeah. you're at that point, you're outside of the restrictions and requirements. Yes. Now, all my research also told me that I could not jam a frequency of a drone that is that is also correct yes then really if i'm at my in my backyard one day and i see a drone staying there way too long which is like about three seconds uh the only thing i can really do is call the police yeah just call just call local law enforcement say i've got a drone over my property I'm not flying and I don't know who is, but can you send a unit out and check it out, please? Absolutely. Yeah. Let them handle. Do you know if they're starting to get a lot more calls like that? You know, that's a good question. I, I think that as the community continues to expand, um, you know, with drones, I think you're going to see more and more calls like that. I don't hear a whole lot of chatter, you know, um, working with law enforcement. They get a whole lot of those calls yet um, because I think a lot of people are quite frankly, a little, a little fearful of losing that drone and and, and getting in trouble. But mm -hmm. if you've got those people, the more that you, it's like anything else, you know, the more cars you put on the highway, the more accidents you're going to have, the more drones that you put in the air, the more you're going to have these calls where people have, are doing things they're not supposed to be doing. They, and sometimes it's legitimately an innocent thing where the drone got away from them and they're like, I have no idea where my drone is. You know, I've talked to somebody who was a recreational flyer and he said, you know, I was flying one day and I lost his signal. And the next thing I know, my neighbor's bringing my drone up to me. He's upset. Why did it land in his yard? <laughs> and, and he tried to explain to him, you know, and I said, well, that's what you just tell them, say, this is what happened. And, and the neighbor very in a very creative and, um, We'll just say a uh, mild mannered way. <laughs> Let him know, do not do this again. And he said, and, I, and I'm not going to because I know I was an idiot and I shouldn't have tried to push the limits. And so, yeah, I think I think the more that you see those those novice flyers out there, you're going to run <laughs> into some craziness like that. Yeah, yeah, because I would not bring that drone back to you a second time, right? If it <laughs> right. got away from you once, I saw it again. Nah, I haven't seen That's it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, and, and that's the other thing is by the way the FAA rules work, you're supposed to actually have your FAA registration number, just like a uh, fixed wing aircraft have a registration number, mm -hmm. drones have a registration number. And you're actually supposed to have that registration number on the side of your drone. And so if a drone would land on my property, I'd look at that registration. First of all, I'd see if it's registered or not. Yep. If not, they're in violation of that part. If they are registered and I've got that registration number, I can reach out to local law enforcement, I can, you know, let them know here's the registration number and they can trace that back through the FAA and find out whose drone that is. And then either get it back to them and then get, or ask them why in the world was it there? Yeah. It's interesting when I was, uh, after you and I talked the other day about having you on, um, and I'll do some research, I try to think if I've seen one and I live in a neighborhood with a bunch of trees, um, and I don't, I can't recall seeing one in the air. So I don't know how common that is with people just doing stupid stuff in a neighborhood. 
Yeah, if you live in a neighborhood with trees, the good news is that a lot of rookie pilots wouldn't dare attempt that. <laughs> um, you know, that they they when they go out, they spend three, four, five, six hundred dollars for even the smallest of the drones, unless it's a little toy drone. You know, and those aren't going to go beyond their property anyway. They just don't have the range. Um, you know, you're you're going to be okay if you live in it. It's, it's these new. Honestly, we see it a lot more in these new housing developments that have gone up in the middle of like a farm field. Yep where the developers come in and literally put up 200 houses in the middle of the field. There's no trees. And, you know, someone from the neighborhood over is now flying their drone and that's, you know, what in the world. And yeah, that's where we see a lot of that. Can I throw a rock at one hoping their camera is not on? <laughs> I guess so. You know, since we're going to be celebrating the 4th of July, I mean, if you really <laughs> want to have a leftover, you know, item there, then <laughs> I could see I, on. Know, I was just shooting yeah. off fireworks. Sir. I, mean, <laughs> I could see on October tenth, the drone gets shot down, and my explanation to the police was, "We had some bottle rockets left over, some Roman candles left over, We're having a little that's fun. Right. Who knew a drone was going to fly by at the same time? Who knew? Who? That's right. Who knew? That's right." <laughs> We're just, we're just celebrating a holiday, sir. That's all. Oh, yeah. uh, it's like Canada day or Denmark day, make up a day, right? I mean, who's going to know? That's right. But right. I would imagine there have been some very tense conversations between people oh, when a drone showed up. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it does happen. It does um, happen. Man. All right. So one of the, uh, one of my favorite questions to ask people on the show, uh, that are married is your wife's name is Emily. So yes. I always like to ask, uh, how did you two meet? And do you both tell the story the same one? How do we meet? Um, and will we both tell it the same way? Sure. Uh, we actually met through a church uh, at the time where I was there uh, at the church and she was there. Um, so when we both met, I, the funny story is this. Um, when we met, uh, I actually went up to her and said, hey, how are you? And she introduced herself. And uh, I grew up and when I grew up, I, I took a National League of Junior Cotillion course. And they always taught us when we shake hands with a woman, never extend your hand first as a man. Uh, let them extend it first. I was trying to apply some, you know, some courtesy there. And so I did not extend my hand to shake hers. Well, I found out later that when we first met, she said, I thought you were really stuck up. And I said, why? And she said, because you never even tried to shake my hand. And I said, well, I thought you were going to extend your hand. And she said, well, I was just waiting on you. And so we had this moment where it's like, uh, you know, we, we were both meeting there for the first time, but we ended up you know, despite uh, being being that way with one another, uh, becoming friends and then ultimately getting married. And and now we've got two kids. So, yeah, life is good. Uh, so where was the first date? The first date, you know, that's a great question. Um, the first date for us, I believe it was actually, we went on, I can tell you the first, I, I think if I get, and she'd have to ask her, but on the order of this, but we went bowling and we went to play golf. And, and I'm not a super competitive person, but, you know, I enjoy those things. So in the community we live, there wasn't a whole lot to do dating wise. So um, we went bowling first. Well, she beat the junk out of me bowling. And I thought, well, I've got to redeem myself. So <laughs> let's go play golf. And then she beat the pants off of me when it came to golf. And so finally, after the third round, I looked at her and I said, let me tell you something. I said, I was going to take you bowling and I, I was going to let you win, but I was trying to keep up with you. I, same thing with golf. And she said, well, Lee, she said, um, there's only a couple things to do around here. Um, I was on my high school golf team, so I know how to play golf and I'm a not decent. You know, I'm not bad bowling because that's the only thing to do. And I said, well, we're going to play tennis next time just so that I, just so that I can get a win out of it. And, uh, and we did, and I, I did win. So yeah, at least that way uh, I could redeem myself on, on the third day. And where did you guys grow up? Uh, I grew up in Raleigh and she grew up, she was born in Tennessee and she moved slowly uh, towards the East. And I jokingly said, if I hadn't stopped her, we met in Pinehurst. Um, if I hadn't stopped her, she would eventually ended up in the ocean and drowned. Yeah. So I'm glad I called her, you know, in Pinehurst. Uh, but she grew up, uh, she lived in, uh, in Robbinsville, North Carolina, and then in Rockingham and then ultimately in Pinehurst where we mm -hmm. met. So that was another connection point because she said, well, I lived in the town called Robbinsville. I said, oh, Joyce Kilmer National Forest. I know exactly where that is. She said, you've been to Robbinsville? And I said, yeah. I said, we camped a lot growing up and my dad loved to travel. And so, yeah, I've, I've been out there. And she said, I have never, ever met anyone who knows where Robbinsville is. <laughs> well, you have now. <laughs> and how far into this relationship did you think, ooh, I think there's something here? Um, 
you know, we'd been friends for a couple of years and, and kind of just hung out in groups. And then we literally um, just started hanging out kind of one on one. And I remember we were sitting in the car one night uh, after we had gone to dinner and she looked at me and she said, you know what? I think we need to do a little TDR. And I said, TDR. And she said, define the relationship. Oh. And I said, oh, OK. And she said, you know what? She said, let's let's just be honest for a minute. You know, we've been dating for a while now. We just hadn't called it dating, but let's call it what it is. And obviously you enjoy it and I enjoy it and I enjoy your company. and You enjoy my company. So, uh, you know, I, I'm OK with that. And you're okay with that, obviously. And so let's let's call it what it is. We're we're dating. And I said, okay, that's I'm good with that. <laughs> we'll go there. So yeah, it, it was definitely something where having the friendship there first made a big difference yep. and the connection points there made a huge difference. And so um, so yeah, it just slowly became what it what it was and and is and yeah, moving on. Now there's not very many other names that are easier than Smith. What did what was her maiden name? It was Davidson. <laughs> okay. oh. Yeah. So I asked her when, when I, and I, when we started talking about, you know, um, the more serious things and in, into the marriage situation, um, I said, well, how are you going to feel about being anonymous now? Yeah. And she said, to be honest, it's going to be kind of nice <laughs> said, because you know, you're, you're going to go from, from a somebody to like a yeah. nobody. Yeah. I mean, cause in the phone book, you know, yeah. it, what, do you, what can you say? Smith and Jones. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. And we, Johnson, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, our uh, nephew graduated from Leesville high school. So we're at the, the graduation ceremony and you've got, you know, they hand you the flyer or whatever. It's got all the names of the people in there and you're right with Smith. There's like, of course that class was 544 people. I'm thinking there's probably about 25 Smiths. in there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's good. The other thing I really like that you do is you are the senior chaplain for the Garner Police Department. That is correct. Um, yes. You have done some other jobs, uh, financial services officer, officer at State Employees Credit Union, general manager at a tailored lawn was the name of the company. Or how does your your yard look at your house today? Right now, it looks really great. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, it needs a little mulch, but other than that, right. the grass is cut and trimmed. Uh, you know, it, it, what do they always say about landscaping? Uh, it's like the the cobbler's kids. Uh, they're yeah. the ones that without shoes. Yeah. Um, when I was doing landscaping, my yard probably did not look the best because I was spending all the energy on everybody else's. Yep. Um, but no, that that was a, a great experience just in management. And, you know, someone described me one time as a high mileage vehicle. They said, you crammed a lot into you know, almost uh, 45 years of life. And I said, I'd like to think of it that way too. You know, um, I, I really enjoy life experiences and I feel very blessed that I've had a lot and, and been able to travel and understand the value of relationships and understand the value of networking. And through my different experiences in the, in the job market, I've seen that, you know, whether it be in financial services or whether it be, you know, in management experience in the technology sector, uh, and you know, different areas, really everything that you do obviously gives you a different perspective. And, you know, Steve job, he, he once said, I, I'm, you know, either you love Apple products or you hate them. Uh, I, I actually like the way that they're built. I like the way they're designed. And so for years, um, I've had them in, and I'm stocking Apple and think it's a pretty good company. There you go. Um, but, uh, but you know, everybody's got an opinion, right? So, but no, he said one time, the broader one's understanding of the human experience, the better design we will have. And, and, and he applied that to obviously what he does. And I think the broader the experience that we have in life, the better the design we will have as far as being able to work with one another and, and serve one another. And so, you know, for me, having those different experiences made a, a big difference, um, in, in what we do here, as far as we see ourselves as a partner. Uh, with with other organizations and, and groups. And so for us, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is about being able to do that and the life experience in that. And yeah, and, and it comes in handy too. I, I know I went to a, a, a banking institution the other day and they were saying, well, I had actually given them a check and they said, well, you know, we're going to need to put a hold on this, you know, because this, this is a really big check. And I was like, okay, well, uh, how long is the hold? And they told me, and I said, well, just call and verify funds. And the teller looked at me and says, well, we can't do that. And I said, what do you mean you can't do that? 
<laughs> and she said, we, we, don't, we can't do that. And I said, well, you know, I worked in financial services for a season. And I said, I know I can pick up the telephone and call and verify the check. You know, um, would, would you like me to help you do that? And immediately the tone changed. And yeah. she said, yep, hang on just one second. I'll, I'll take care of that. <laughs> so <laughs> having that experience way back then definitely helped out to be able to say, you know, hey, and that's what I mean. I mean, it, it is yeah. about life experience yeah. and being able to apply those different things to what you need to do. And so, uh, so yeah, so I've, I've been very much enjoyed the experience and love what I do with chaplaincy. Um, you know, I, I've been involved in nonprofit organizations and in churches my whole life. And chaplaincy is something where you see a different side of the community than you would in any other way. And um, I, I love that. I love being able to serve the community that way. I love to be able to serve the department that I work with in that way. Um, you know, I, I, I just enjoy being around people and I enjoy being around and being able to serve, uh, serve them. And, you know, you, you get to see people uh, at their best when you, when you're in business a lot of times, and then you get to help people when sometimes they're at their worst, when you're doing chaplaincy, where they're dealing with grief or they're dealing with a struggle within the family or whatever. And, and I, I really enjoy that. And that's given me a talking about perspective again, that's given me a perspective that I had never had before in the, in the work that I had done, um, being able to sit on the side of literally a bridge on a major highway with a, with a young person who had contemplated jumping off that bridge and being able to sit down with them literally on the concrete and say, I'm here, talk to me, tell me what I can do to help you. And let's try to get you the resourcing that you need so that your life can get turned back around. And then to have the parent call three, four weeks later and say, I don't know how and why you were there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say why, other than that. I know there's a higher power that exists that put you there, but thank you for being there because your presence there made the difference in my daughter's life. Good. Good. What can you do with that? Yep. You know, I mean, that, yep. that's the kind of thing that you, you can't, you, you, how can you put a how can you put a price on that kind of relationship and that kind of experience? And that's what I love about chaplaincy and what it does for me. Yeah. You used you used to be the executive pastor at Shiloh Baptist Church. Uh, do you remember? And I grew up Catholic, so I'm going to call it a sermon. Do you remember the first sermon that you had to write and do? Yeah, the first sermon that I had to write. Um, let's see. That's a great question. And how nervous were you? Do you think? <laughs> Actually, believe it or not, uh, I was not that nervous to write it. Um, public speaking has always been something that everybody else gets nervous about. I never <laughs> have gotten nervous about that. I think I'm with because you. I grew up speaking in the church. Um, I was really involved in my church growing up at First Baptist in Cary. And so I remember being sixth grader going up and speaking in front of the group about the Royal Ambassador Program. And, you know, this was a, a large congregation. And so, you know, from my early days, I was always involved in that side of public speaking. So it didn't, it didn't, um, didn't make me nervous. I do remember the first sermon I ever wrote. Um, it was out of the, the Gospel of John because um, John is always a great, great go to. And I just remember thinking to myself, I hope I don't misquote anything. <laughs> I hope I don't misquote anything. Um, and so, and, 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 and you know, my, when, I, when I preach, I always tell people my job is to keep you awake. <laughs> and hopefully the Holy Spirit is going to do the rest. So if I keep you awake, then then I'm going to put that on, on, on God to take care of the rest of it. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's one of those things that, yeah, I've, I've always enjoyed doing that as well. So when when people ask me to speak, you know, on behalf of the business, talk about drones and they say, are you nervous about that? No, I, I'm I'm good. <laughs> you know, I don't right. mind that at all. All right. So it's, how it's, I'll, t I'll tell you what I told our local group when I did my 10 minute presentation. They said, well, you know, you got it coming up. Do you need a what do you, what do, what do we need to know? And I said, to be honest, I, I, I'm used to speaking a lot more than 10 minutes. Yep. So for me to be able to condense it down to 10 minutes, that's going to be the challenge. It's not going to be saying stuff. It's going to be the reverse of that. So we've <laughs> had the other pastor in the group on the show, Steve Grice, uh, with uh, Grice uh, Insurance Solutions. We'll give him a good plug. Uh, same thing. The first time that we started doing that, he goes, Ooh, I don't know if I can keep it to 10 minutes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, all right, so let's apply the, my goal is to keep you awake to B and I. So when you're doing your 10 minute presentation, your goal is to keep us awake, but who's the, who's the closer in that group in church, the Holy Spirit. So you're a closer, 
who's closer in our BNI group. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that that's a good point. I, you know, I always have thought if I would do this with drones and I would just have a drone like flying mm-hmm. right next to me the whole time, Yep. Uh, you know, the closer would be the drone just to fly out and see how many people are still dodging the drone, you know, on yep. the way out the door. Like, um, but uh, <laughs> but no, I think I think just to, you know, when I when I share what we do yep. to just help them understand. And and honestly, I do a lot with with video and photography and in that experience. And honestly, I always say, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, a video is worth 10,000. Oh yeah. And so to be able to show the video and I'll tell you when I did that in my 10 minute presentation, they said, you know, Lee, I understand what you do, but wow, do I get it now? Because I, I showed them a video that I shot, um, actually flew it at Dorothea Dix um, Park where we start out on the grass and then we rise up to the tree line. And as we get higher and higher, more of the city becomes apparent. As you go all the way up to the peak of that 400 foot level, then the city really begins to expand and you see that um, that perspective. And so they get literally. And so they, they said that video, wow, that just, that was the closer, you know, then. Yep. And if we've learned anything from news in the last few years, it video changes everything, doesn't it? It does. Because you can it hear, does. oh, somebody said this happened. Okay. And all of a sudden you see the video of it. It's like, ooh, okay. That changes the conversation. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. If, uh, if somebody listening or watching the show today is thinking about getting a drone, because they've always wanted to do it. They've tried a couple of them. They had a friend who had one, whatever it was, and they enjoyed that. What are the first couple things they need to do to stay out of tr- out of conversations with the law? Okay. The first <laughs> the first thing is remember the line of sight rule. Yep. Um, remember remember where you're flying. Um, don't fly it over property that you don't possess. That's the easiest thing. You know, I always tell people get, there are a lot of great places that you can go fly your drone. Um, obviously, other than your private property, you know, there, there are parks that have um, drone areas there where you can fly nice open fields where oh. you can practice. Um, so I always tell people, go where, do a little research near you, find out what parks are available, find out what open space is available. Or if you've got somewhere that you think, hey, this would be great, go up to the property owner, make contact with him, say, listen, I've got this new drone. I want to try flying it. Do you mind if I? And, you know, see what they say. Uh, you know, some people may say, no, thank you. Other people say, Hey, you look, just don't run in anything. You're yeah. fine. Um, but know that, know that you need to be flying in an area where you've got permission from the property owner or it's your property is the easy way cool. to do it. And then the other thing is kind of, um, stay out of water, stay out of trees, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> and, and I always tell people that because I actually gave this as an example, um, in B and I one morning that, you know, there was a person I knew that was flying a new drone that they had bought over the lake and they were trying to get some shots of them out on their boat. And all of a sudden the drone ended up in the, in the lake. And they said, I don't understand. I thought I was high enough off the water. And I said, well, you have to understand with drones, they don't have human eyeballs. They have electronics in them that tell them what height they are. Well, a lake is like when the sun beats down on it is like a natural mirror. It reflects and the drone gave the wrong altitude only by a few feet but he was flying so close to the water that those few feet mattered (laughs) and he ended up with a very wet drone and at that point it becomes a great story to tell and a model (laughs) on the shelf (laughs) because they don't make drones yet that fly well once they've been wet and they um, going back to your apple example you can't put a drone in a bag of rice and it dries out you can use it right that's correct. <laughs> Believe it or not, he said, he said, you know, I put my, my, put my drone in a bag of rice, but it didn't work the same way as my phone. And I said, you're right. It did not. And it will not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. But, but, but I will tell you that if you fly them enough, you get used to it. I actually have a drone that has, believe it or not, has water skids on it and I can actually land it on the water if I need to. Um, I don't recommend that. I recommend you fly several hundred hours before you get to that point. But um, but it can it can be done. But that's the other thing I always tell people: practice what you're doing. There's a guy. There's a actually guy in our BNI group who was getting a drone uh, last week, and he said, "Hey, listen, um, I'm getting this. What do I need to know?" And I gave him kind of the the thirty thousand foot view, broad strokes kind of thing. I said, "The key the key thing is just practice with it. Yep. Just practice with it. Practice with it where you don't." And I said, "And I've got a program that I can run through with you. We can get together one on one, and I can give you some skills that you can go through." Um, 
you know, but really the, the key is to know where you're flying and people think, oh, well, you know, I'll be fine. I've got this really nice drone with object avoidance on it. Again, those are not eyeballs, those are electronics. And so what it thinks is an object avoidance issue may not be and vice versa. So, you know, it, it really is something where you just need to use your own common sense and your own vision and understand, you know, if you fly really, I mean, it, object avoidance works great in a drone when you've got a tree or a building there. But when you've got a guide wire or a, a cable running to your house that's, you know, the size of a quarter, it's not going to see that most likely. At least some of them don't. And so um, you don't you don't want to impact that. That would be that would be a bad day for you and a bad day for the power company. <laughs> oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And and the neighborhood because their power is out because you were enough. That's right. That. Yeah, that's right. So no, the, just, the key yeah. when when people go buy one, I always tell them, just go buy one. Always understand this too. You're going to break something on a drone. As you learn to fly, your whether it be a propeller or whether it be you're going to crash it. Um, I had, you know, to tell a funny story, one of our b &I members, uh, I was actually out on site with him the other day. Um, even, even those of us who have been flying for years get stupid from time to time. I was standing there, I was hand launching the drone. There's a way that you hand launch it safely. I was standing there, I was talking to him, I was light, I was launching it. You're supposed to do it open palm. What did I do? I got my finger too close to it. The next thing I know, the propeller comes around and it slices my finger open. Oh. And here I am. And what did I do? I dropped the drone. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And this is a $3,000 drone. And I'm yeah. going, oh my word. And he looks at me, he says, what are you going to do? And I said, well, if worst case scenario, I'm going to go to my backup drone who's in the truck. And he said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'll be fine. I went to got the first aid kit out and wrapped it up. Yep. So all, I mean, we all do stupid stuff from time to time. Um, More, but, but yeah. just to be safe about what you're doing and, and understand that it, you are putting yourself, when you got, put something like that in the air, you are putting yourself at risk, you know, of it coming out of the air. Um, it's kind of like the old adage that you've probably seen the news article that came out recently. Hey, it's July 4th. Please don't go outside and shoot guns up in the air. Yep. You know, the bullets come back down somewhere. Yep. You put a drone up in the air, it's going to come down one way or the other. Either you're going to bring it down or it's going to fall down. So just be aware of the liability and be aware of where you're flying. And that's why I tell people have fun with it, but understand there's going to be some, some rules that you have to follow yep. common sense and safety. Yearly. So when you, uh, when that blade, when the propeller hit your finger, your bre your ego was more bruised in that finger, wasn't it? <laughs> it? It absolutely was. I literally said to myself, you idiot, <laughs> you know, better, you idiot. What were you thinking? And yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting. There was a, a company that did a test not too long ago. Um, when the FAA released some of their, uh, authorizations on flying drones above people. Because a lot of people say, well, why does it really matter? You know, they're so far up. It ha ha Because those blades spin at such a high rate. I mean, it will slice flesh. Yep. And, and I saw the video and I watched it and I thought, man, that'll do some damage. Not knowing three weeks later, I was going <laughs> to test the thing with my finger. And I can tell you that it'll do damage. You know, um, yeah. So I'm going to have a nice scar, you know, from it. <laughs> but other than that, yeah. it'll be all right. All right, we've been putting Lee's phone number up on the screen during the show. If you are in need of some very good aerial footage, uh, they can put it together in a marketing piece, still photography, aerial photography, video, all that good stuff. Please reach out to him for that. And Lee, each show I have a couple of notes that I put down on my spreadsheet just to remember because this is episode like 204 and, you know, I'm old. So I like the fact that you are Maverick and your spotter is Goose. So that'll be one. And then I believe forever and ever and ever, Lee, I'm going to remember the cotillion handshake. <laughs> there you go. That's right. That's right. The cotillion handshake. Yeah. I look forward to meeting Emily one day and asking her version of that, which probably will be. And she'll, and she will probably tell you the yeah, same thing. Yeah. She's like, you know, when we first met, he was so stuck yeah, up. Yeah. I sense the way you describe her. She's probably a pretty decent storyteller. So I bet it'll be pretty good. Right. She, she is. She is. You get her talking. I, I, I would, I would love to see what the explanation is. There you yeah. go. Uh, all right, folks, if you're ever in Smithfield on a Tuesday morning at eight 15, want to go see some of the professionals in that area, uh, business owners and sales professionals you need to meet to grow your business or start a business, please come by and visit. And we've been putting Lee's number on the screen there. So give him a call if you need stuff. Lee, appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you again, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity. And we'll see everybody next time on Triangle BNI.
You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.